And hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 339, featuring the third installment of my interview with Mr. Julian Golub, the creator of XCOM. This is the episode where Julian talks about Laser Squad, uh, the earlier Rebel Star Raiders uh, game and the sequel to that, as well as XCOM. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Julian Golub. All right, so in round 84, I guess, is when we get the, what seems like a big turning point in your career, Rebel Star Raiders. Yeah. You know, it's a tactical squad level game. And, you know, what, what was, it seemed like a very ambitious game. I saw where some accounts said that you had left school to work on this. I was wondering if you could kind of flesh this out a little bit. Well, this is after I'd left school, so I was... Uh, so you graduated was, already. Uh, yeah, and... Um... I was taking a year out before going to university, so um, I, I say the first game I worked on after school was um, Nebula, and then I went on to Rebel Star Raiders, and this, basically Rebel Star Raiders is the origin of XCOM. That's where it all started. And, okay, it's a relatively simple two-player tactical squad-based game, but you still had individual characters with their individual names and their different weapons and it was turn-based tactical game uh, two players only no ai uh, science fiction theme and um, that was the precursor of essentially my later games and xcom so i thought it was inspired by a game or two games i, I guess sniper and something called yeah. snapshot yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those games and their connection. Well, Snapshot, I can't remember much about. Um, uh, in fact, I'm not sure I ever played it. I may have only read the rules. But Sniper I played a bit more of. Um, well, Sniper was a World War II squad-level tactical simulation uh, with individual soldiers and weapons. And you had things like Opportunity Fire and um, various types of munitions and grenades and how they affected the outcome. Uh, things like morale effects and so on. So there were a lot of elements there which definitely made their way into Rebel Star Raiders and my future games. I guess after that's when you did Rebel Star. Uh, so Rebel Star came after, uh, after Chaos. So yeah, straight okay, after Chaos. Okay, so then with Chaos and then Rebel Star. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So Chaos and then Rebel Star. And Rebel Star was a return to the two-player tactical squad-based game, this time with a scrolling map, um, much bigger environment, had an AI to play against. Again, had morale and stamina and health ratings for all your soldiers. They could pick, th so pick things up, drop things, exchange equipment. Um, so it was an evolution of the Rebel Star Raiders system a lot of amazing stuff in here. So, so you created the, the pathfinding algorithms just from scratch? Yeah, I had no idea how to do pathfinding. And um, the way I did it, I actually took the map and divided it into boxes and wrote a table which basically said, you know, if, if you're in this box and you want to go to that box, then first you've got to go to this next box. And I had a very sh sort of primitive short-range um pathfinding algorithm but this was the long range one and this was implemented basically by looking up a table so you had you originally intended this to be a one or a two player game and then the yes publisher said it had to be a one player campaign i mean that must have been that's right yeah and i have some 3k of <laughs> data left in the uh, memory to um yeah basically 3k left to to program the AI with the data, so it was a very short space. I saw something about a miniatures game called, I think it was Harlow. Does that sound familiar? No. No? So then in 88, you did Rebel Star 2. Uh, yeah, 87, I think, probably. 87? Yeah. So what did, what did that one add to the to the mix? Well, it added... Uh, it's basically the same game, but it added an interesting scenario where you're fighting against an alien menace, and you had a slightly more elaborate victory condition where you had to steal the alien eggs and then evacuate on a spaceship. 
So it's quite an asymmetrical game with asymmetrical um, picture conditions. Um, but it was uh, pretty cool. So really by this point, would you say you were pretty well known in the industry? Not as far as I know, no. <laughs> so still very obscure? Yes. <laughs> what about when uh, you put out Laser Squad? Did that change? Uh, yeah, that changed things quite a bit. Um, so this was the first game of my new company that I'd set up. And I was able to deal directly with the press. I'm not going through a publisher. We were basically publishing the game. Um, it was, again, a step up from the Rebel Star system. You had soldiers. Again, it was two-player tactical or versus AI. You could equip your soldiers this time. You had distractible terrain and line of sight system. Basically, a lot of the elements that were the foundation of the XCOM tactical system. And we had three um, missions in the game that you could play with extra missions that you could order on uh, by mail order with a little coupon at the back of the instruction booklet provided in the game. And I think we made a couple of expansions to that. Uh, so that was, I think Laser Squad is the game that um, made me um, personally more popular, I guess, well known, I guess, because I was now dealing directly with the game's press. There were versions of that for the Spectrum, Amstrad. I think your brother did a Commodore version? Yeah, Commodore 64. And then there was a version made for Commodore Amiga and Atari ST, and also PC, in fact. So that really made the run. Oh, I did have a question from uh, Anatoly. wanted to know. <laughs> what, what do you think about that DOS version of this game? DOS version of what? Of Laser Squad. Oh, the PC version. Well, um, I didn't have a huge amount to do with it because it was done by uh, another company, Chrysalis Software, <clears throat> who were our publisher. But um, it was a bit clunky. <laughs> and they tried to make it look more attractive, but basically keeping the same game. Uh, but it worked. It was okay. So I guess this is the point where you started to work on the game that would ultimately become XCOM, right? After yeah. after Laser Squad. I, I was reading about this demo of, I guess it was Laser Squad 2 still at that point, but a demo that you had made using the Atari ST. Yes. That you were showing around, how isometric graphics. Yeah. And the, the story, I read a couple of accounts of this, so you were looking at publishers and I guess settled on Microprose. Yeah. Yeah, because Microprose were our, um, well, at that time, we thought Microprose were simply the best um, computer games company in the world, bar none. Thanks to Sid Meier, uh, a couple of his games that really stood out, such as Railroad Tycoon, and I think Civilization was, um, I think at the time we were making the demo, it was in development, and it hadn't been released at some point where we were sort of finishing up the Lace Squad 2 demo. So we thought that Microprose were the the number one company for us to go to to approach for publishing our next game. So it sounds like uh, you're a huge fan of Civilization. Yes, I was at the time, yeah. yeah. Um, my brother as well. In fact, he played it more than I did. Yeah, when I read that, I started to think about... For some reason, it just never really occurred to me to put to think about XCOM... And civilization, they seem like such very different kinds of games. But you know, the more I thought about it, I do see a lot of uh, interesting parallels. I guess you can sort of see an inspiration. Yeah, well, there is some. Yeah, there's a direct influence there. And in fact, Microprose UK, um, when they saw our demo for Laser Squad Two, it was it was them that wanted to make it a bigger game because they wanted something that could compete with Civilization. And you know, the elements they wanted in the game, they wanted like this elaborate research system which had an equivalent of the Civilopedia that you get in Civilization, which of course became the Ufopedia as we called it. Um, and they wanted it set on Earth and th they wanted this, this, you know, they wanted something much larger that tied in tactical battles um, 
and not just as a sequence of missions, which was what the original Laser Squad 2 was going to be. That's interesting to me that they'd want you to... I mean, it makes sense in retrospect, but you know, how did you feel when they said they wanted you to set it on Earth? Because I think originally it was just well, alien races, right? Yeah, they they suggested the theme of UFOs. Um, in particular, they were influenced by Jerry Anderson's TV series, UFO. And um, What, did, what a show that is, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so obviously there are there are elements in that show which also have a direct um, uh, impact on the design of XCOM because in UFO, the TV show, the whole thing is about trying to intercept the UFOs as they're coming into Earth. So you've got the moon-based interceptors and then you've got the airplane-based interceptors and if the UFOs manage to get down, land on the Earth, then he had a ground-based interception force, which tried to then capture the aliens and so on. So those kind of elements were were in were in XCOM, but without the moon-based interceptors, of course. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I have to admit, I'd never really heard of that show, you know, before doing oh. the research. I guess, <laughs> I guess it didn't. You know, I don't remember seeing it on uh, PBS or anything. I um, guess it was a pretty big show there. It was not as big as Thunderbirds, but it certainly was influential. Yeah. I'm surprised they haven't wanted to remake it or <laughs> reboot it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're also a fan of was it Bob Lazar? And Bob Lazar. Of, I Bob don't know Lazar. Name. Bob Lazar or Lazar. I don't know how you pronounce his name. Yes, he was. Well, I was a fan of him. I think his story was um, featured in a book called Alien Liaison by Timothy Good. And I took a number of elements from that book, including Bob Lazar's story, which was about his alleged employment at Area 51 reverse engineering UFOs and how they were powered by Element 115, uh, which of course became Illyrium in uh, the game. And there's also stuff about cattle mutilations and abductions, which were all featured in a little way in, in Nexcom as well. Well, just a quick question here. As long as we're talking about uh, Sid, did you talk, ever uh, interact with Sid Meier? Do you have any input on it? I, no. I met him once, and this was after XCOM was um, published. and um, must have been 96, maybe. I understand and, he was um, kind of ostracized. Was it the, uh, was the, the president of uh, the company? I'm trying to remember his name. Yeah, um, Bill Steely. Stu moment was he so still? that's that's the point because oh, Bill Steely had oh, this... sold his shares to um, Spectrum Holobyte and um, Sid Meier I don't think was very happy with this situation, but I don't know the full story behind it. So they asked you if you could do this for PC. Yes, you said sure. <laughs> yes. No problem. No problem. No problem. Uh, but reality was, this was your first PC game, right? Yeah, and then we panicked. <laughs> because although we saw the PC as, you know, the the emerging best games platform, especially for the kind of games that we wanted to do, uh, we had absolutely no experience with it. And we, we hit a roadblock very early on because of the, the limited addressable space of the PC. The PC was designed for a maximum of 640k and there were two competing systems to to add memory to that was something called extended memory and another thing called expanded memory and these this page swapping system is very complicated and we were basically tearing our hair out trying to figure out how to make this work um, until we got the the Whatcom C compiler which was um, a real um, solution to the problem because it gave you a flat memory model and you just had contiguous addressable space. You didn't have to worry about memory management. Um, up to 32 megabytes of addressable space, depending on how much memory your machine had. So um, that solved our technical problems mostly. <laughs> so it sounds like you warmed up to the idea of PC development. I yeah, we loved it because we started programming in C and we, we left behind assembly language and we thought C was fantastic. Simple, easy to use, easy to debug, very powerful. But there are also versions for the Amiga. And I think I saw CD32. Yes, yeah, we programmed the Amiga version and we worked on the CD32 version. 
Um, there was also a PlayStation version, which we didn't work on, but it was done. It's not like you're a little skeptical that was going to work out. Well, it, it worked okay, actually, surprisingly. It's obviously not as efficient as playing it with the mouse, but it did work okay. Yeah, I was Assault wondering if this... I haven't tried to play any of these ex- new XCOMs with the with a console. I guess they're out for out for them, but it seems so easy to control it with a mouse. I would hate to have yeah. to, try to control it with a controller. <laughs> so I guess it was just a complete coincidence that the X Files show came out around this time. Yeah, complete coincidence. I mean, a really good coincidence because I think that you know serendipity that, right there. Serendipity, absolutely. Um, because obviously the, the writers of the X Files had drawn on some of the same source material that I was drawing on the whole, you know, alien conspiracy thing, the little alien greys and men in black, cattle mutilations, and all that stuff. So it was uh, it was great. All right, so I guess this was a real heyday for what is frankly my favorite genre: these, these turn-based uh, strategy games. I love those. I just want to keep <laughs> keep playing them. Yeah, but... plus, yeah, you got Master of Orion, Master of Magic. She said that when Dune Two came out, after that, it's just kind of people started to lose interest in this. Well, the yeah, the RTS craze really started to hit ninety five, ninety six. By I think by nineteen ninety six, almost everybody was developing RTS games. Do you feel bad about that? Uh no, not really. <laughs> well, I think it's a shame that the turn-based games got left behind, yes. Um, but, you know, the, this RTS game fad, I mean, it came and then it went. Um, so nowadays, RTS games, you know, at least big-budget RTS games are a complete rarity. Um, there's only really StarCraft left, I think, as being one of the really big original franchises left that are still being developed perhaps i i don't know but do you have anything that you wanted to say about terror from the deep <laughs> i know you didn't really uh, care for it um well to be honest i didn't play it very much and um i i i think it was basically because the you know, it's just like the original game in a way i mean the game system was the same except harder of course um I didn't care too much for the theme and the graphics in the game, but um, I think it's probably a worthy entry into the series, if not very innovative. I was watching a little YouTube show, and they were talking about that game, and they they said it was it seems so. The reason it seemed so hard was that the first game had some kind of glitch in the difficulty. Yeah, is that true? Yes, there was a there was a bug in the save game code, which meant that once you'd saved the game. No matter what difficulty level you selected, when you reloaded the game, it always put you on the the easiest difficulty level. So that's the way everybody played it. <laughs> so they thought they were playing on hard mode, I guess, and that was. Yeah, I think this bug has been fixed in the latest release, which you get, which you can get on Steam. So I think that that game that does have the the real difficulty levels in it. Yeah, I was going to so, say, because when I played it, I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I sure hope it wasn't on easy mode, because wow. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, should be back uh, next week with uh, uh, the fourth and final installment of this interview with Mr. Gollop. A lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned for that. And as always, I want to thank you very much if you have supported the show. If you are one of those Matt Chatters, one of those Rat Packers, uh, if you would like to join that august company, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. A buck an episode, guys. That's all I ask to keep this content coming to your inbox. Uh, So please, if you haven't already, uh, step up to the plate. Go to the Patreon site. It takes about 15 seconds. Uh, to set that up and plus you might find a bunch of other sh- uh, other cool uh, shows and other things there you would like to support as well so go check it out patreon really cool and uh i think you'll like it uh let's see uh, what about that news from the matt king Oh, 
oh boy. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Do I have some news for you. Uh, this is uh, uncovered by uh, Jedi Master Radek. Radek? Radek? Is that the same guy? This I'm pretty sure he's a Matt Chat Patreon. Which shows you how cool he is. Uh, let's see. New Vampire Bloodlines trademark spotted. So he posted this at RPG Codex and it's been picked up by a couple other news outlets. Uh, so basically what's happened here, as far as I can tell, there's been a trademark filed by White Wolf, who is uh, now owned, I believe, by a company in Sweden. And there's some chances, uh, there seems to be some, some possibility, at least, that we might get a new Vampire Bloodlines game. Yeah, that's, of course, uh, really exciting. Uh, by the way, if you haven't noticed, if you haven't ever watched my uh, review of that game, uh, go check it out in the, uh, in the vaults. Uh, you can learn more about the game. It's really cool. And one of the sort of, uh, I would say, underappreciated gems of the, of the era. Uh, so anyway, this is really good news. I don't have a whole lot of extra information on it, but it's definitely fun to speculate about that. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Combat update on Bard's Tale 4. So it's been a while since we talked about the new Bard's Tale game. Remember uh, when it was being kickstarted. Uh, but anyway, they posted a pretty neat overview of how the combat is going to work. And I wanted to uh, read a little bit of that to you. Uh, let's see. Axe-wielding warriors can cause their targets to bleed, which causes them to take damage whenever they move around the battlefield. Once that effect has been applied, shield and clubs get to work. These blunt armaments can often knock an enemy from one uh, grid square to the next, throwing them out of their ideal position and opening up attacks to the more vulnerable glass cannons they've been protecting. The nice thing is, uh, when you forcibly move an enemy, it also triggers the bleeding effect. If done right, you get a nice ping-pong combo. Uh, so that's just an example there of how they're trying to innovate on the Bard's Tale combat. It definitely looks interesting. It's kind of hard to uh, to explain some of this stuff. So just go check out the uh, the update. Look at those screenshots. I'll post a few in this video. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm excited. Definitely want to see uh, or experience this because, you know, it's one thing to see it and another thing to uh, play it. So we'll see how it goes. And let's see, last bit of news, I finally got around to watching The Goonies. <laughs> Yes, I know, it's terrible, but, you know, everybody's got those big 80s films uh, that they've always meant to see and somehow missed out on back in the day and have continued to miss. Uh, fortunately, I decided to rectify that error uh, this morning. It's a really good movie, really holds up well. Uh, people were joking that I, sh I should have to do the, uh, uh, the, the truffle shuffle and all that stuff so anyway i'm glad i finally watched it and i might if, if there's other 80 movie uh 80s movies that you haven't seen but you've always wanted to see go ahead and watch those uh, when you get the chance to let me know what you think uh, how, how well does it hold up all right i think that will do it uh, what about that drink of the week well yeah this week i've got uh what the hell is this 1893, uh, this is uh, ginger cola, and it's made by Pepsi Cola, but as you can see, it's very special because it comes in a small gold canister. Yeah, Premium cola, spiced with real ginger. Anyway, I have, uh, I was really curious about this. I love ginger, and you know, if I got to choose, I'd probably go for a Dr. Pepper, but <laughs> Pepsi's probably my second favorite of the uh, big sodas. Let's see. So apparently it's got real ginger in it, cola nuts and some other interesting items. But anyway, let's get this uh, 1890. Why do they call it 1893? I wonder. Uh, doesn't say. Real sugar apparently though. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so let's get this in here. And I can already smell the ginger, so that's exciting. So I'm guessing this is going to taste like a Pepsi meets ginger beer. We'll see how that works. It better be pretty good because that was like a, I think a dollar, maybe like a dollar fifty for that little can. Ah, well, it definitely smells good. It smells a little bit like a Pepsi. I don't really smell the ginger. It just smells kind of a... Maybe I do smell a little bit of ginger in there. It's kind of a... I guess it smells like a, a Pepsi uh, with a little hint of ginger. That's what it smells like. I bet it's probably going to taste like that too, but uh, let's give it a try. Actually, I was wrong about that. 
Uh, the ginger is really strong in the taste. Uh, it's almost like you taste the ginger first and then a little bit of a Pepsi aftertaste. It's uh, actually quite uh, quite nice. I wasn't expecting uh, this much flavor from this. I guess I shouldn't be uh, prejudiced against these uh, mainstream brands. I mean, this is really good stuff. Uh, that ginger is uh, really, uh, you really taste that. Uh, there's a lot of a sweetness, of course, uh, but it's not it's not too much. I think they got the, the sweetness about right, just to counteract the uh, uh, the sort of tang of that ginger. I'm not really sure what a cola nut, I guess that's just a cola, uh, what that's all about. But anyway, it tastes really good. Yeah, I gotta say, they, they, they nailed this. You know, if you like ginger and you like Pepsi, <laughs> I mean, this is uh, the combo to get, I guess, uh, $18.93. Uh, tastes way better than I was expecting. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I, I would drink this, no problem. A little bit on the pricey side, I guess, compared to just a regular Pepsi, but uh, it's probably worth it if you want something that actually tastes... Uh, <laughs> not, 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 not that there's anything wrong with a Pepsi, but uh, this has a little bit more of a interesting taste, uh, shall we say. Uh, anyway, I'm going to go uh, 5 out of 5 drinking horns on this. Uh, ginger Cola, they seem to have really nailed this. Uh, I'm going to uh, taste it one more time. Yeah, really good. I mean, it's like a really good Pepsi, really uh, fresh uh, Pepsi with uh, uh, just the right amount of a gingery taste. So, uh, 5 out of 5 drinking horns on this. eighteen ninety three. If you see this in a grocery store, Walmart, whatever, uh, go ahead and pick it up. I think you will be pleasant. All right, so I was looking up for quotes about UFOs, and that brought me to Carl Sagan's uh, page for some reason. I guess uh, probably his uh, book, Candle in the Dark, which I just read, by the way, and highly recommend to you. Awesome book. Uh, but he talks in there. He's, he's a skeptic about UFOs, uh, even though he supports Sadie. Uh, but anyway, this is the, uh, the quotation. I thought this was really cool, maybe a little bit scary. Uh, and it goes something like this. We live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. <laughs> uh, so ponder on that and see you guys next week.